Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction House taking a look at some of their cool guns in the December 2014 premiere auction. Now I initially planned to do a video on a Chicago Palm Protector pistol. It's, they're pretty cool, and there's usually one in this auction. And they're always interesting to look at. They're the sort of thing you don't see very much these days. Um, however, when I got here and started looking through the catalog, I realized they have not just the Chicago, but also the Manhattan Palm pistol that preceded it, and in fact a French manufactured variant of the very original gun of this design. So I figured we'd pull all three of them out and take a look at them. So these guns were initially patented by a Frenchman by the name of Jacques Turbot in 1882. They were manufactured in small quantity and for a short time in France uh, before the design was licensed to a man named Peter Finnegan here in the United States. He was, as you'd guess from his name, an Irish immigrant, and he really was the main manufacturer of, of what these pistols turned out to be. So he initially ran the Minneapolis Firearms Company, where he made palm protector pistols for a short time. And then he shut that company down and opened the Chicago Firearms Company in 1892. Now his plan with that was he was going to, he didn't actually manufacture these guns himself in Chicago. Instead, he subcontracted the work out to the Ames Sword Company, which is actually, if you're a bayonet collector, you'll certainly recognize that name. Ames went on to do quite a lot of business for the US government with bayonets as well. At any rate, he thought he had this great opportunity to sell a ton of these palm pistols at the Chicago World's Fair in 1892, and he contracted with Ames to manufacture 15,000 of them. Well, Ames wasn't able to, to get that quantity out in time, although they had signed the contract for it, and a whole bunch of legal battles ensued. In the end, Finnegan won. Um, about 13,000 of these guns were made in total. All of them had been manufactured by 1898, uh, and they were sold between 1894 and about 1910 before they finally sold out. Um, it's kind of interesting that while this, this embroiled mess of lawsuit was going on, Ames continued to manufacture these guns and almost got to the full 15,000 quantity uh, before everything was resolved and Ames ended up losing the suit. At any rate, they're a very interesting pistol, so let's bring the camera in and take a closer look at exactly how they work and what they do. All right, so here we have examples of all three of these, all three variants, major variants of these pistols. The smallest one out here is the French-made one, Le Protecteur. Take a look at the markings on that. There we go. And on the other side, Brevet SDGD is uh, a patent marking. Now, this particular one is in a 22 center fire caliber, which is interesting and a bit rare. The next one we have is the Minneapolis manufactured one. go. Get the light just right there. And then the last one, um, you can see this is kind of a fancy version of the Chicago. They did also make them quite a lot with the, the plain side plates. But this one that we happen to have access to today is the fancy version. So both the Minneapolis and the Chicago here are in 32 caliber rimfire cartridges. Uh, these both have a 7-shot capacity. The French 22 version has a 10-shot capacity, which is interesting. It's actually smaller and holds more cartridges. They pretty much operate in the same way. I'm going to go ahead and open up the French one here because it's in the best condition and it's the best manufactured of them as well. Um, one interesting thing to take a look at, we have this little arrow. You have to rotate this top plate 90 degrees until that arrow points at this little removal notch. We can pull the top plate off. So you can see that this center axis has a couple keyways on it that are matched on the plate. So that's what holds the plate in place. Now in the center here, right there, we have our hammer. And you can see it's got a firing pin on it. What I do is hold the pistol with a couple fingers, first two, middle two, whatever you want. And then the, the, the meat of your thumb sits on this, which is the trigger. This is mechanically a double action revolver. So when I press this in, it rotates the cylinder and it cocks and then releases the hammer. Now to, to disassemble this the rest of the way, what I have to do is 
uh, cock the hammer enough that it, the firing pin comes out of that cylinder, like that. And then I can drop out the cylinder ring. So this is a, a turret style cylinder, holds 10 cartridges in there, and we have uh, notches on the bottom, just like a typical revolver cylinder would. Looking at the internals here, we have this spring-loaded catch right here is what rotates the cylinder into position. This is our spring. So you can see when I push this, I'm doing two things at once. I'm rotating the cylinder to index to the next shot, and I'm also cocking the hammer. When the hammer gets to full cock, this catch slips off a sear up here, releases the hammer, and fires the gun. You can see there that that, that firing pin is centered. This is a, a center fire 22 caliber cartridge. Pretty slick. There is a safety on this. It's this sliding bar, basically. You can see there's a hole in the back of the frame here and a pin mounted to the spring on the trigger. Well, if I engage the safety by sliding it back, it physically blocks that pin from proceeding any farther, from going through the frame, which means all I can do is cock the gun this far. So that's not far enough to index the, the cylinder, not far enough to fire the gun. One thing you will see is that this does come to rest with the firing pin extended. So you would want to load nine and carry this on an empty. Reassembly is pretty much the same thing. I have to re uh, pull the hammer back far enough to drop the cylinder into place. And then we'll put the little arrow right there, rotate it into position, and we're all set. So you can see this conceals extremely well very small, very handy. 10 shots in this thing. There are, of course, no sights, but it does have a rifled barrel, which was, I found a little bit surprising. Uh, and frankly, the barrel is, is significantly longer than a lot of similar style, very concealable early self-defense pistols. Oh. Now, if we take a closer look at the Minneapolis, it's basically manufactured the same way. Uh, Finnegan took the, the French design, didn't really change it. Um, it's in a 32 caliber cartridge, but that's about it. Um, you can see it still has the same locking system here. Uh, the, the cylinder, because the, the chambers are larger, only holds seven rounds. The safety mechanism, which I believe is this, but this one's locked up fairly tightly and doesn't want to move, so I'm not going to force it. I believe that is a rotary safety on there and that's preventing me from doing much else with this one. So we'll put this one back together. Now these are pretty rare, the French ones are pretty rare. The one you usually encounter is this, the Chicago Palm Protector. And this one has a number of changes to the mechanism. For one thing, it has this additional lever out on front. This locks the cylinder and prevents it from rotating unless you depress it with a finger. So that would allow the the cylinder to rotate inside. It's just a simple locking catch. Um, the whole gun is bigger and substantially heavier, interestingly. Um, the French French version is actually quite light. The Minneapolis is, is a little bit heavier being in a larger caliber. The Chicago is, is surprisingly hefty, actually. Now the, the locking system for mounting the top plate is also different. There are four small keyways on the outside of the plate. There you go, you can see them there. There's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. And those lock into matching recesses here in the outside of the frame. So our disassembly is the same. I'm gonna pull this hammer back far enough to drop out the cylinder. Um, the manufacturing tolerance, the manufacturing quality on the Chicago guns is really not, clearly not as good as the original French ones. In fact, let's take a look at both of them side by side. 
I don't know exactly how well this is going to show up on video, but it seems just that the fit and finish on the French-made gun is has a lot more effort put into it than the Chicago, which I guess makes sense if you figure Ames was making these while they were in the middle of a lawsuit that might result in them not making any money from them whatsoever. Uh, you can see this is uh, serial number almost 8900, so this is a fairly late production one. That may have something to do with the the manufacturer quality. But the mechanism in here is exactly the same. We have the main spring here, you have your sear over here, hammer and firing pin, as worth pointing out. You can see there the firing pin on this one is offset to the side. This is a rim fire 32 caliber. I don't know if you can see the rifling. Probably can't get in there to see the rifling, but this is also a rifled barrel. And then we have our catch for indexing the cylinder right here. And you can see this lever operates this little catch right in there, which unless you have it depressed, prevents the cylinder from rotating. Let's go ahead and put this back together. go pushes in and this one only rotates about 45 degrees thanks for watching guys hope you enjoyed having the chance to take a look at not one but all three variants of this neat old style self-defense sidearm uh, if you're interested all three of these are for sale at the rock island auction coming up in december got links to the catalog pages for all three of them in the text below so take a look you can see rock island's high-res pictures and set up an account and place a bid on any one or all three of them today if you're interested. Good luck.